Hi, my name is Mike Aben, and welcome to episode 21 of my KSP campaign. What this episode is going to be about is going to be a double rescue. A rescue of two Kerbals stuck in low Kerbin Orbin, Carol and... <laughs> I can't remember what the other one's name. But uh, Carol and somebody else, we're going to be rescuing them using the Curse Stock 5. This is going to be a redo of a mission that failed a couple of episodes ago. So hopefully on our second attempt here, things will go a little bit better. But before we go, go there, uh, i got one brief thing to show you here. This is the orbit of the ascent stage of Muna 2, which was launched and landed on the moon in the last episode. And I messed up a bit in placing it here. It has an orbit with a periapsis of almost 69 kilometers. Uh, normally I like the periapsis to be around 50 kilometers. Um, I've explained my logic behind that, but it allows me to go back to it and deorbit it later. But 69 kilometers, I mean, that's almost out of the atmosphere. I mean, I got lucky in one respect in that if it was just a little bit higher, if it was just above 70 kilometers, then that's completely out of the atmosphere. And this thing would stay in orbit indefinitely, and I would have to come up with something much more involved in order to get rid of this debris. And I am a debris Nazi. I hate debris. I need to get rid of them. And so uh, this will deorbit eventually. I just need to go around a whole lot of times. Should kind of mention actually, maybe with the, at this moment, uh, the, the sort of that KSP version of the atmosphere suddenly just cutting off at a particular altitude, and with with Kerbal Space Program seventy kilometers, that's obviously really artificial, right? <laughs> real atmosphere doesn't do that. Like when people say how high is the atmosphere, there really isn't a good answer in in real life around the Earth. There really isn't a good answer to that the atmosphere just kind of keeps getting. Uh, more and more nebulous, more and more thinner as it goes out. The International Space Station, for instance, really is still in Earth's atmosphere. It is slowly deorbiting itself, and if left to its own devices, it would burn up and crash back into the atmosphere. And it needs to actually boost itself back up on a periodic basis. And that's true of anything that's in low orbit around the Earth. It, it, they, they all have some a bit of atmospheric drag on them, and it will take time for them to deal, but not in Kerbal Space Program. Kerbal Space Program, you're above 70 kilometers, you're magically in a perfect vacuum. Uh, below 70 kilometers, you suddenly are experiencing drag. Anyway, suffice to say that uh, this took a while. <laughs> the reason is because while you're in the atmosphere, I can only go at four times warp, and slowly this thing got more and more of its orbit in the atmosphere, so there was quite a lot of time spent. I had to keep the vo this piece of debris as the focus vehicle, so I had to just kind of ride along with it, or else it doesn't have any atmospheric drag on it at all. This took a while. The other thing, too, is I have very little control as to where it will eventually end up putting down. Normally I want these things to go down close to the Kerbal Space Center to maximize the amount of return I get on recovery, but uh, here I have very little control and what the hell? A tank of oxidizer is leaking. Okay. <laughs> I got a word message here to say, yeah, tank of oxidizer is leaking. Okay, oh, that's dang it. Oh, like I care. <laughs> That alarm is obnoxious, and it's really, but like, oh, yeah, I don't care if all the oxidizer leaks out. That doesn't really matter. Now, if I can only figure out how you turn off the alarm. Okay, I don't see any buttons for dang it. Just check in here to see if I can add it to the toolbar. No. No, 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 not missing any dang it buttons. Okay, how can I turn off this alarm? There are no buttons here for dang it. These are all other mods. Oh, for goodness sakes. There must be some way to turn off this alarm. This is going to drive me crazy. Well, subsequent uh, research <laughs> said that uh, at, at the uh, dang it website said that you just turn off the alarm by right clicking on the part. But unfortunately, I have no connection. In fact, I have don't even have a probe body on this, so I can't affect anything by right clicking on parts, so that's why I can't uh, turn off the alarm. Now it does say that I can adjust the settings for how long this alarm will go for. The default for high priority items like this is that it goes on infinitely. <laughs> so, but you can adjust that 
from the Kerbal Space Center. So all I have to do is go out to the Kerbal Space Center and adjust it. Oh, son of a bitch! You're kidding me! Oh, man. So I can't adjust the settings. I can't leave this vessel without abandoning this mission. Which I think... Oh, I don't know what it'll do. Will it put it back to where I was before? Oh, well, it... I don't know. Oh, what a pain! Okay, well, this is my solution. What I ended up doing was just muting the sound. I ended up just doing this with the sound just turned off. And in fact, why don't I do that for you, too? Ah, uh, that's much better. If only the real world came with a mute button. Anyway, in case you were wondering, by the way, why don't I just wait for it to come out of the atmosphere, uh, and then I can go to the Kerbal Space Center. Well, it turns out my entire path now is in Kerbin's atmosphere, so I didn't even have that option. So basically, yeah, I just wrote it down now with the mute. I mean, it's not that big a deal, really. And in fact, it gives me a bit of an opportunity to check out the Trajectories mod. The Trajectories mod is something I've had installed for some time, but it only started to uh, uh, work for us once we upgraded the tracking station. So you can see here, it's showing us our trajectory. The part in red is the part in the atmosphere. In fact, it's, well, all in the atmosphere. And it puts this nice red cross at its predicted landing location, which, as you can see, is far away from the Kerbal Space Center, which is marked by that red dot. It gives you a number of settings that you can play with as well. What I use a lot is the angle of attack. This guy is going to be going down on an angle of attack of zero. In other words, nose first. Yes, you've seen the trajectories mod quite a bit in the future, so we'll definitely take an opportunity to talk about it in more detail. It's really useful for, uh, f you know, powered descents, uh, aerodynamic descents, like with space planes. It's great for aero braking. Really, really useful. You'll see it a lot if you keep watching these particular videos. So here we are, blazing forward, getting approaching the lower part of the atmosphere. Temperature gauges are plenty everywhere. One in particular at the front there that seems to be getting very hot. Um, I don't like this with the sound off. What's it like with the sound back on again? <clears throat> Yuck. Okay, no, 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 we'll turn that back off again. There, okay. Yes, so I'll have to do this in silence. So, yeah, uh, it seems to be doing okay. Um, oh, so, whoa! <laughs> Ooh, something exploded well there. All the parachutes are fine. Uh, nothing overheating on the parachutes. In fact, a look around. Oh, I think that was one of our smart parts. Yep, definitely a smart part exploded. Okay, no big deal. Parachute's still intact. That's all that matters. Yeah, this thing would be doing a lot better if it was around the other way, going down retrograde engines first. The engines can take quite a bit of heat, but... Well, I have no control of it, obviously. The tail fins at the back is moving that center of lift way back, and that's why it's going like this. It's kind of, it's, it has the aerodynamics of a dart. What are you going to do? Um, it really would be much better if it were the other way around. And the way you get that to happen is actually with air brakes. And, oh, there goes our parachutes right on cue perfectly. And now it flits the other way around because the center drag, obviously, by those parachutes completely overwhelms everything else. Yes, air brakes are the way to get it to flip around. If you have deployable air brakes at the top, which I've yet to unlock, you can deploy those and then that will get it to go down engines first, which would be great. But uh, this, uh, uh, other than the, the spot where it's coming down, this, this worked absolutely perfectly. I love this. Uh, I've been having some adventures with these chutes. The secret that I have learned is, with real chutes, the difference between arming a parachute and deploying a parachute. In stock, you just simply deploy the parachutes, hitting the staging button. Um, and then if you are in something like space, it will know, oh, well, he doesn't really mean to deploy them. You know, I'm just going to arm them. Um, with real chutes, you have to know the difference. In staging deploys the parachutes to arm them you have to use an action grouper to right click on them i finally had that all straightened out and it worked exactly the way i wanted to so it's just simply a matter of waiting for this thing to touch down uh it's going nice and slow but unfortunately i really would prefer this to land in the water uh the if the odds of this staying upright after it touches down are pretty much zero if I get better landing gear, one option is to put deployable landing gear on the bottom, but 
right now we'll just I, I don't know I just like to plan a landing it in the water but unfortunately I just didn't have control of where this is gonna go yeah there is a bit of a slope here I'm trying to see if I can recover no no there it goes boom oh something else exploded and hey, most of the rockets good the expensive parts are good like the engine KOS computing core is good yeah, I'll call that a success that went all right and while it's fresh in my mind back at the KSC what I'll do is now adjust these dang it settings uh, let's see here so high priority which obviously the oxidizer was a high priority minus one means it'll beep forever so these are the number of beeps I, I guess they mean the number of beeps not the number of seconds so I'm gonna change I still want it to be a pretty high number because you know I want it to catch my attention if it's something important how about 50 50 beeps I can live with 50 beeps I think that won't last too long yeah that'll be good and in what will hopefully be the last explosion of this particular episode this is junk sat one uh, junk sat one a couple of episodes ago I set a maneuver node to have it uh, impact the moon I that Maneuver node actually came up while I was in the process of uh, capturing Muna 1 last episode, Muna 2, I'm sorry, last episode uh, around the moon. And I didn't show it to you because that video was already getting too long. Um, it was just executing a maneuver and then jumping back to Muna 2. Um, but I thought what I would do is show you this impact. And again, this is just me wanting to try and keep my sky. As clear as I can of useless junk so just about ready for impact it's always disappointing uh, Mike wants bigger boom for something that was supposed to just take I don't know brief I think was the word I used at the beginning 12 minutes that wasn't brief I always end up doing that. I don't know. I think I just talk too much. <laughs> I always end up thinking I record all this stuff and I go, that should be enough for a short video. And then once I edit it and talk about it and everything, well, it, it ends up, it always end up longer than I think it's going to be. But we are now here. We're going to do our rendezvous. This is going to be a double rendezvous. This is the Curse Stock 5. Curse Stock 5, you saw a couple of episodes do a spectacular failure because I didn't put any Kerbals on it and didn't put any kind of communication antenna on it and all I made was this intercontinental ballistic missile that just, that was the end of that. But this ascent went perfectly fine because now I do have the appropriate communication equipment aboard. Again, no Kerbals on board. Instead, I have a Probo Dovodyne Octo Probe thing controlling it. Um, but no Kerbals on board because this thing only has space for two and we're going to be rescuing two Kerbals. Um, I, la I launched ahead of the Kerbal that I'm planning on getting first. Uh, they're positioned very, very poorly. So I basically just picked one of them at random and went there in an orbit a little over 80 kilometers. So I went into an orbit that is 120 kilometers circular orbit. Um, and with the idea that then I can start to set up my maneuver node and allow the one that's in the lower orbit to catch up to me. And I think I'm just going to make this just about rendezvous. I've got maneuver nodes now, so I'm going to talk about how to use maneuver nodes to do the first rendezvous. And then the second rendezvous I'm going to do using the rendezvous information that comes with Kerbal Engineer. So I've already selected Carol as my target and I am setting up a new uh, retrograde maneuver because I'm in the higher orbit obviously using precise node as you will always see me uh, use and you can see those close encounter indicators the orange one and the purple one uh, the fact that I got two sets of those is indicating that uh, I am crossing the orbit twice so I go forward in time until the point where those two are pretty close together and if you're crossing the orbit twice, even when they're pretty close like this, that means you're burning too much. So that's an inefficiency. I always like to make these, even though I have as much, I have a ton of fuel. Efficiency is not an issue, but I still like to be as efficient as I can. So try to get it so that you have only one of these sets of these close encounter indicators. And then you're just playing around with the timing of it and with the amount of the burn 
to get those encounter nodes as close as they can be. Now these two orbits are pretty much in the same inclination, so this burn is just going to be nothing but a retrograde burn. Um, and after just a little bit of playing around, I got my closest approach to be uh, 0.2 kilometers, which is more than adequate. And uh, unfortunately though, the actual burn itself is 43 minutes away. I really didn't pay too much attention during my launch because I had two objects that were in almost opposite sides of the planet. So I just kind of said, ask her, just launch it and we'll figure it out as we go. And I don't have anybody on this vessel at the time, so I didn't worry about life support. So I thought I'd just go with it anyway. Uh, so that's why the, the, the burn so far away. But what that's what time warping's for. We time warp out to it. We perform our burn, a little bit of time warping again just to until we're getting fairly close to where Carol is and then we can start thinking about finishing off our rendezvous. Now I have uh, done a rendezvous before. Uh, I uh, We rescued Ribfelt quite a number of episodes ago. I can't remember quite how long ago it was. Um, so that part of it is really just exactly the same. You want to point yourself retrograde. You want to take a look at the retrograde icon on the nav ball. Make sure you are in target mode and you want to eventually match velocity, but at the same time, you want to push that retrograde vector onto the uh, target icon. And uh, my best advice to people would be to take their time with this. Um, it's really easy to kind of come in too quick and blow right on by. So, you know, if, if you end up slowing yourself down too much, that's no big deal. You got time warp, time warp yourself out to the vessel. It's better to go slow and use time warp than it is to come in blazing hot and end up missing your target or even worse, crashing into it. You may also recall from my adventures with Ribfell a number of episodes ago that uh, by the time I came within the render distance of Ribfell, I got all these alarms from uh, TAC life support that Ribfell was out of life support. Well, what ended up happening is, is I went and got into the save file and checked all the various Kerbals that I still had to rescue and none of them had life support. It turns out when they spawn, they are spawning with no resources whatsoever. Um, that seems to be a squad decision. Um, obviously in the stock game where there's no life support, well, who cares? If they don't have electricity, they don't have monopropellant, doesn't really matter, does it? But with life support, it does. So what I did is I actually just edited the save file when I picked up these contracts and gave them life support. So that's why you're not seeing any warnings this time around. Anyway, just got to come in nice and close, kill off my velocity, get my relative velocity down to zero, and then it's just a simple matter for Carol to fly on over, get into the curse stock, and then it's time to start thinking about picking up our second uh, missing Kerbal. That second Kerbal being Lafia. Uh, so we select her as our target. Uh, this is about the worst case scenario where she's on like the complete opposite side of the planet. I'd, it'd be much easier if she was closer and a little bit behind me. But what we're going to do, do something a little different. We're going to use the rendezvous information from Kerbal Engineer. Um, actually, Kerbal Engineer has a switch to tar or sorry, uh, target select button that's actually really, really nice to use. I could have used that to select Glafia, but nonetheless. Now, first thing I need to do is allow Glafia to catch up to me. So I need to put myself again into a higher orbit. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to push myself into a 120 kilometer uh, by 120 kilometer circular orbit. And it was while I was in the process of time warping out to Apoapsis to complete my circularization where all of a sudden I went, well, wait, well, what the heck is that flying by? So it's only about 44 kilometers away. What? What? Oh, no, it's it's her. <laughs> it's Glafia. She's down there in that lower orbit. She's so close. She's only 44 kilometers away. Oh, I probably, I'm trying to think if I could have planned this probably could have planned this a little better. I bet you if, if I didn't push my apple lapses up quite as high as I did, I probably would have been able to meet her back around at periapsis again, come really, really close. Shoot, I didn't think that type of a maneuver was in the card. I'm trying to play with a maneuver to think about 
Like I'm really thinking about, is there some way I can just get to her really quickly? And no, I don't, I don't really think she is. She's already blown by me and she's going faster than I am. Oh, this is a real pain. Now, the only thing I could think of doing, and maybe somebody who's more clever than me could think of a way of recovering from this situation, but the only thing I could think of was to complete my circularization at 120 kilometers uh, with her ahead of me and going faster. That's unfortunate. So I had to then time warp all the way around the planet to allow her to, for a while, to allow her to go all the way around and catch back up to me. Oh, this could have been done better. Anyway, talking about Kerbal Engineer, what I'm looking at is the intercept angle. And specifically, when the internet intercept angle gets to zero, that's when you're ready to do your rendezvous with your target. Now, we are coming up, you can see it's 159 and change. We're coming at it from that end of it, the big end of it, right? 160 degrees is the same as zero. So as I get into 160 degrees, I start my pro gray burn. And I'm just waiting for those close encounter icons to appear. There they are. And I'll just burn as they get closer and closer together. And oh, oh, geez. Okay. Well, this isn't the best situation in the world. I mentioned before, when you see two pairs of them, that means you're crossing the orbit twice. Well, there's not much else for me to do just to keep burning prograde until one of those, I'm looking at the purple ones, uh, get close to zero. There we go, 0.2 kilometers. Again, more than adequate. You don't even need to get as close as that. Oh, and although I think I do prefer the maneuver node method of, uh, of doing this, but uh, this worked out fine as well. With that accomplished, of course, it's just a matter of time warping and then completing our rendezvous, which of course works exactly the same way as you've seen in the past. So I'm not gonna spend any time with that. Instead, we'll just go straight to Glyphia, uh, coming across and entering into the curse dock five. Oh, oh, look at that. They're twinsies. I got twinsies. <laughs> Looks to me like they got the exact same texture. Oh, that's not good. You know, I thought about maybe, uh, I, should, I thought for a brief period of time I should change them, but uh, then I thought, you know what? They got rescued together. I think I'll stick with that. That's kind of cute. So, Clara, Carol and Glyphia, forever twins, but in desperate need to put their feet back onto the surface. So let's get ready for our descent, which you've seen me do lots of times before. The big difference being, this time I have the trajectories mod along. So I've time warped over to the other side of the planet, open up the trajectories window. We're going to be going in backwards, retrograde. So we're going to turn the angle of attack all the way down to 180 degrees. Just now noticing that little retrograde button there probably a handy button. I'll have to try that next time. But anyway, point ourselves retrograde and start burning. And now you can start to see that red part of our trajectory. That's the part that is going through the atmosphere. You can actually use a maneuver node and trajectories works with the maneuver nodes too, but I don't know. I just like doing it this way. I know I'm going to burn retrograde, so what's the point of setting up a maneuver node? And we keep burning. The other thing that it does too is it gives us a prediction on the max G forces. You can see it, max G forces is around 2.8. Uh, that's really nice actually, especially when you go to do arrow breaking maneuvers where your craft perhaps is not quite, is maybe a little bit more delicate than this thing that's going to have a heat shield and all that stuff on it. Anyway, there's the Red Cross out in the middle of the ocean for our predicted landing spot. I always find trajectories tends to predict long. Um, I'm not quite sure why. I don't know if that's maybe something I'm doing wrong. But anyway, we time warp our way around. Uh, we can get rid of the escape tower. We don't need that anymore. We can get rid of the service module because we don't need that anymore. Uh, you can start to see too that uh, checking back with trajectories now, now that we're in the atmosphere that uh, yeah, it's quite a bit shorter now than where it was predicting before. Now to be fair, uh, I have ditched about half the stuff that's on this craft, right? So, you know, maybe maybe that has changed its aerodynamic properties significantly. I don't know. Uh, I'll have to keep a closer eye on that perhaps in the future, but the descent went without any issues whatsoever. I didn't quite make the ocean as you can see here, but I am coming very, very close to the Kerbal Space Center, so that's that's great.
And Glafia and Carol turned out to be a scientist and an engineer, which is great. Because uh, I, was in, I had three pilots and I needed more scientists and engineers, so now I have three, two, and two. And I hope my two newest Kerbals don't suffer the same sort of fate as some of the other Kerbals that I have rescued from Orbit. Uh, actually, I have a pretty bad track record. If I go back into my previous campaign before this one, the last four Kerbals in a row that I have rescued from Orbit have all come to sticky ends. And I haven't killed anybody else besides these people that I... This is not by my choice. It's not like I make them do riskier things than anybody else. I, I, I'm not quite sure what's going on, but I'm, I'm hoping that, that uh, my two newest Kerbals will beat the trend. And speaking of our latest Kerbal Death, Ribfell, this is a very special mission because this is our first mission of the Otter 1 since the uh, crash on the runway that, that killed Ribfell. And uh, there's nothing particularly special about the mission itself. We're going to do some EVAs on some surface locations, which are well, we're coming up to them. They're all, all three of them are actually pretty close to each other, though a reasonable distance from the Kerbal Space Center. And Jeb, as you can see, is performing that particular mission. And uh, then we also have uh, some crew reports. We have to do one at an altitude below 19,500 meters and one above 19,500 meters. And those two waypoints are actually located over the North Polar Ice Cap. So the Otter 1's not going to do those. Instead, we're going to launch in a couple of days the Otter 2, and you'll be seeing that in the next episode because it's capable of doing greater distances and reaching higher altitudes. Um, I'm not going to spend much time with this mission because you've seen so many of them before, other than to honor this particular mission to Ribfell. So we're going to conclude this particular video with uh, Jeb's planting of the flag. Yeah, for Ribfell. There we go. Anyway, that's going to conclude this particular episode. I thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next time.